All right, let's uh, let's go, to the Lord. Let's ask for His uh, His help this morning. And uh, Bill, would you pray for us? Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us in it. Father, we pray as we look at the book of Romans that you would continue to teach us more about who you are, more about who we are, and more about your grace towards us. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, book of Romans, we are in chapter six. We're halfway through chapter six. A way of reminder, chapters one through three, he lays out his case uh, that everybody needs God's grace. Everybody needs the good news of the gospel because everybody is condemned. Whether you are a Gentile who grew up without religious background or the religious background anyway of, of Israel, um, uh, God says you're, you're still condemned because you disobey what you know in both creation and conscience. We reject the fact that there's a God who created us as evidenced in all of creation and uh, our, our conscience uh, testifying uh, that there is right and wrong. We rejected that. Or whether you're a Jew who grew up um, with the teachings of the law and the prophets, we've rejected that uh, by uh, not merely acknowledging that it's right, but by not doing it. So uh, whether you have the law or you don't have the law, everybody, uh, regardless of your, yeah, your, your background, where you're born, all that kind of stuff, everybody is condemned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. Which, if that was the end of the story, that's bad news. But that's not the end of the story. There is good news in that God sent his son, Jesus, and he is the uh, incarnation of the righteousness of God. And that he lived a perfect life, died the death that we deserved. He was condemned in our place, rose from the dead uh, three days later. And now there is good news that we can be justified. So we formally stood condemned under sin, but then we, by faith in Christ, can be justified, declared righteous, clothed in his righteousness, to now have a legal standing of being right with God. How does that happen? Well, that happens through faith. Well, I wish we had an example of that. Well, we do chapter four of Romans. This is Abraham. Abraham is the example of how one is justified, and it's by faith, trusting in God's promises, um, not just doing better, right? Then what does that produce? Well, that's where we are now. So we have condemnation, justification, and now we are in uh, the section you might call sanctification. What does it look like now that we have been justified? What you know, what does it mean to be a child of God? So we've seen um, back in chapter five, we've seen the results of the gospel is that we, re we have freedom now to rejoice. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God and Christ's return. We rejoice in the fact that even now in our trials, we know that God is shaping us and molding us and making us like Jesus. And we rejoice in God himself, that we know him um, both now and we will know him uh, forevermore. So there's great reason to rejoice. Uh, there's also the freedom from the curse. We saw the second half of chapter five that Jesus came to reverse the curse. He came to undo what Adam did. Uh, Jesus is the second Adam, the greater Adam, who obeyed as Adam did not. Adam's disobedience brought a curse that kills everybody. Jesus's righteousness brings life to uh, all who will believe in him. And then last week we got into chapter six where we see that we are free from uh, sin's slavery. We are free from sin's slavery. And he wants us to know chapter 6, verses 1 through 10, three times. Do you not know verse 3? We know verse 6. Verse 9, we know. And what he wants us to know is that, or he wants, yeah, he, he is telling us that we do know this if we are believers and must know this if we are believers, um, is that your relationship with sin has changed. That sin used to own you. It used to call and you'd say, what time? It would, it, would, it would call you and tell you to do something and you say yes, because it was your master. That shows up in every, all kinds of different ways, whether it be just like, let's go to Vegas, or whether it be, you know, squeaky clean, moralistic on the outside, but corrupt uh, heart on the inside. Whichever way you went in your rebellion, everybody rebelled and everybody was a slave to sin. And what Paul wants us to know is that you don't have to do what you used to do because you're not who you used to be. Because your union with Jesus changes everything. That just as Jesus died, so by faith you're united with him and you have died to your old life and to sin. Your relationship to sin has changed. 
And then just as Jesus rose from the dead through your faith in him, you too have been raised from the dead to now walk in the newness of life. That is pictured in baptism. Uh, but that is, there's a spiritual baptism that happens upon conversion that unites you with Jesus. Old man dies, new man alive. Uh, old woman dies, new woman alive. And then that now we walk in the newness of life just as Christ was raised. So we too are. We got to know that. He says, we got to get that straight in our minds so that when sin calls and says, hey, I want you to come over, what you say is, no, you, I'm dead to you and you hang up. You don't own me. You can't, you can't call me anymore. Um, you are, uh, you're blocking that number, if you will, for forevermore. That is your posture towards sin. Okay. Now, what we got to remember is that sin, we have, sin's penalty has been paid for. So we're no longer under condemnation. Sin's power, we've been delivered from. Both of those, that's happened in the past to be delivered from sin's uh, penalty. In the present, we are freed from sin's power. We don't have to obey. You don't have to give in to sin. But in the, we will be one day freed from sin's presence, but sin's presence is still here, and we still fight against it. And what makes it so hard is we still have our sinful flesh. There, that's still there. So when you become a Christian, you receive the Holy Spirit of God who empowers you to obey, but the sinful flesh doesn't go away. That's why we still are, um, are temptable. That's why it's that part of us that's a magnet that still wants to do things that disobey, that, that dishonor God. It's because we still have our sinful flesh. Um, so there's an already but not yet experience to our salvation. Um, there's, there's a war that is going on. So in light of that, verse 11 of chapter 6, let's pick it up there after all this we know. I know we made it through verse 14, but just we need a running start for where we're going today. So maybe go ahead and read for us, bless you, 11 through 14. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. All right, that's good news right there. So verse 11. So here's your first commandment in, in the book of Romans. First command in the book of Romans. You've been, you've been through already five Five and a half chapters, the very first time he tells you to do something. Which again is striking. All the way through the Bible, this is God's pattern. God acts on our behalf, and then he says, look at it. See it. Believe it. Receive it. See what I have done. Now you respond. Which again is the exact opposite of every other religion. Every other religion is you do, you do, you do, you do, you do, and then you know me. In Christianity, God says, I have done this. Now come and know me. So God accomplishes it on our behalf. So again, uh, and the first command is uh, to reckon yourself or consider yourself. It is a, um, it's a command to, um, yeah, to make a decision about how you're going to relate to to sin, to how you're going to think about it, how you're going to um, consider yourself to it. So you've been told, know this, now now take what you know and make the decision. That's how I'm going to think about it. And that this is a, in, in the original language, it's in the present tense, which means it's an ongoing thing. You are going, this is your relationship to sin now. You're going to consider yourselves dead to sin. And you're going to do that when you wake up. And you're going to do that in an hour after that, and an hour after that, and an hour after that, until you see Jesus. It is an ongoing posture of the heart in which you are intentionally deciding to say, I am dead to you and you are dead to me. That is the first commandment in the book of Romans uh, is for you to say, uh-uh, and just to keep the hand up the whole time until you see Jesus face to face. No sin. You consider yourselves dead to sin. And at the same time, consider yourselves alive to God. Really important in the Christian life. Holiness is not just stop doing bad stuff. It is equally as important to 
pursue God. So it's flee from sin, pursue God. Both are equally important. You've got to repent to turn from, but repentance is also turning to. So you're turning away from sin and you're turning to God. It's not just a, I'm going to stop doing this sin and I'm going to be a better person. That is a dead end road because you need, you need a greater uh, joy, a greater uh, pursuit, and you need strength, you need fuel, you need power, and that comes from God, okay, from faith in him. So notice here, there's a continual considering yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. And, and where does that happen there in verse 11? Consider yourselves alive to God. In Christ Jesus. So again, everything happens in Christ. Our relationship, I'm alive to God because of my union with Jesus. Jesus is the center of everything that we think, do, and say. So after that's our, that's our posture, now in verse 12, um, what is the, uh, what's your next command here? Yep. Don't let sin reign in your body. Because what does sin want to do? <laughs> yes, it wants to reign in your body. <laughs> sin wants to set up shop. Sin wants to come in and say, hey, say this. Hey, do this. Hey, think this. It wants you to, um, it wants to reign in your, your body. It wants to be your Lord. It wants to be your master. It wants to dominate you. Uh, to make you do what? There in verse 12. Obey. Yeah, obey what? Passion. Yeah, it's passions. There are sinful passions. Sin wants you to obey them. Wants you to, fo to follow them, to satisfy them. There are, there are yeah, sinful desires that we have. Um, and there's thousands of different flavors of those. Um, and whether it be, uh, well, let's just try it. What are, what are some of the, the passions of flesh? What are some of the things sinfully that it wants? It, it wants your body, but to, to what end? Okay. Sorry. What are the things that you're temptable toward? What kind of pleasure? Because there's good pleasure and there's bad pleasure. Like you can walk out this morning and see that sunrise and be filled with pleasure. And that's a, that's a good pursuit. Sexual immorality. Okay, so there's sexual immorality, right? So a misuse of your, um, of your body uh, in regards to, to, to sexual enjoyment. Okay, what else? Anger. Anger, right? So the, the, the passion of the flesh is to rage because at somebody or something, right? To lash out, vengeance. Okay, good. What else? Gossip and slander, right? You have to use your words in a way that are going to tear down others, which has what sort of effect? Yeah, of making yourself look good, right? So you're going to, the reason you gossip or the reason you slander is so that you can make others look bad and ultimately make you look good. All right. What other passions of the flesh? Greed. I want, I want money or the house or the notoriety or I, I want more, right? And in a way that's not content, right? So contentment is, is the other end of that, but rather the greediness. Substance abuse. Yeah. So you're going to look to things, uh, whether it be drink or drugs or whatever it may be, uh, to find uh, an escape from reality, you know? I mean, that's, that's why I used to, to smoke, smoke weed. I mean, I would go, I mean, I could, I went for years where I, I was either drunk or high, you know, six out of seven days because life was just better that way. I had freedom and peace and joy, which is exactly what God promises to give. So I was trading God for an idol, something to escape reality. We could go on all day, but there's our passions, and we all have different ways that we're temptable, right? Sin wants to come in and say, hey, let's let's do that. Let's go. You know you want to. You know it's enjoyable. You know this is right. Come on. You deserve it. Or, hey, they deserve it. Get them, whatever it may be. 
And what we need to do is continually consider ourselves no to that because yes to God. Because you can take each of those sins and turn, turn it on its head and there's, there's worship to God with it. Like with all of those things, there's ways that you can use your words to build up, not tear down, right? I mean, you can go through all of those sins. And we want to we use our bodies now for, for the Lord, which is where he goes in verse 13. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. What word shows up twice there? Well, there's a couple of them that show up twice. It starts with a vowel. You know what a vowel is? A E I O U, sometimes Y. What, what's the word I'm looking for? Instruments. Instruments. Yeah. So tell me, tell me about how he talks about our bodies here. They're tools that can be used for good or bad. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's what our our bodies are. They're tools. They're instruments that will be used. Either for what? What are your two options here in verse um, 14 or 13? Unrighteousness. Or unrighteousness. Or righteousness. Or righteousness. So you're either going to use your body for one of two things. It's either for unrighteousness, sin, following after the way of the world, uh, under the commandment of the devil, according to passions and pleasures that are dishonoring uh, to God. Or you're going to use your body as an instrument for worshiping God under his command, for his pleasure, for your joy. Those are the two options for the way that you're going to use your body. So again, remember, your bodies are not inherently sinful. It's not like you've got to get rid of your body. That's, that's not the answer. The answer is to call your body into submission to call your, your physical flesh, uh, your physical body, to yield to God rather than to yield to the, the, the flesh. Because there's, there's two kings. You'll remember this is where we start, start at the, the beginning of this chapter. There's king sin and there's king grace. And you have been liberated from king sin by Jesus and brought under king grace uh, who wants to produce righteousness. And your body is either going to be used for, for God or for Satan or for uh, righteousness or for unrighteousness. What comments, questions do you have about that? I know that's where we ended last time, but I felt like we were kind of rushing there at the end. So I wanted to, to set that up because it's going to be important for the rest of chapter six. Comments, questions, anything on that? How is that, how's that section helpful for you in your daily, daily walk with the Lord? What's, what's useful there for you? Yo. As we're trying to distinguish between uh, our bodies not being sin, but some of our desires being sin, yep. is it, uh, well, where would you draw the line between temptation and sin when it comes to physical desires? Yeah. So, um, well, I, I think the, the line is, when you begin to entertain the the impulse toward evil so i, I think what we need to be able to say is t temptation can cry out right and then we are our, our sinful flesh can say oh that sounds nice and that's where this moment there's a fork in the road and there's the, well, let me think about that and daydream about it for a minute. And then you, five minutes later, you're like, wow, where, where have I just been? That's sin. Like you're entertaining uh, this, this temptation. So you've, you've given in in some measure uh, to that. And that can go from that all the way to pursuing it, finding a way, acting it out, covering it up, pretending it didn't happen, and then finding ways to keep doing that. Like oh, that, that whole spectrum there, that's all sinful. For you to be tempted is not sin. You, you're not, it's not sin to be tempted. Um, it is what you do with the temptation um, that, that matters. Uh, do you know, know, know um, 
I remember this as a young Christian, I was listening to a John Piper sermon and he said that sometimes he'll freak his family out because he'll be in the study and some wicked thought will come in and he'll just be like, no, no. And he'll be like, what's going on? And be like, sorry, I was getting tempted in my brain. And they're like, okay, sorry. You know, but like, um, you know, so however it's got to go down, I think there's an awareness to like something is, is invading and knocking on the door. Hey, come think like this, or, Hey, what about her? Or what about him? Or, Hey, what about that? Or, you know, and, and it's, You've got to make the decision, Lord, help me. Right now, I, I, I feel myself desiring to think about this or to do this or pursue that. That actually turns the temptation from an opportunity to sin into an opportunity for worship. So that putting your hand up and saying, Lord, help me here is worship. So it, it, yeah, it beats the devil with his own stick in that sense. So does that make sense? Yeah. That's yeah. So, so. It's, it's, it begins in the heart, in the mind, in considering yourself dead to it, right? So when it comes in, you're like, no, 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 I'm not going there, right? Good. Other questions, comments along those, along those lines? Okay. Yeah. So it says, let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal mind. So when you struggle with sin, like, sometimes I... I don't know, like, it says, just don't do it. And sometimes I don't know how to just not do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. The way you just not do it is that you grab truth by faith. So the reason you're, st- so the reason you're here, the reason you get up at whatever time you get up to get here, is because you want to you wanna get some truth that you can know, chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. There's stuff you know now that you now know the difference between a truth and a lie. When it comes to whatever it is. So, uh, yes, when I was stopping smoking weed, I started to, I needed to know some stuff about what, what I sought in, in smoking a blunt. Like I, I had to, I, I, I had, I learned, okay. I was seeking freedom. I was seeking joy. I was seeking peace. I was seeking some sort of escape. I was seeking things that the Lord promises he wants to give me. So I got to know, Lord, when I hear that calling out, I've got to start with, what do I know? So what I know is that you promised me joy and you promised me freedom and you promised me peace. And you actually tell me it's dangerous to just escape from reality, that I can come to you with all the things I'm afraid of or all the things that I don't want to deal with, that I can bring it to you and cast my anxieties upon you, knowing that you care for me, not just you know, not my blood cares for me and is going to fix my problem. Um, and then also, Lord, I, I know that this is going to cloud my mind. Lord, I'm going to not be able to think clearly about your word for the next, you know, three hours or whatever it is. Right. So I'm going to I'm going to need, Lord, I, I, I want to think rightly. Tell me to worship you with my mind. So I know that I'm not going to be able to do that well if I take a couple hits here. Like, so I help me. And so what that's all. Like part of that's part of the Christian life is you're you're wrestling with di- difference between truth and error. So it's not just a don't do it. It's a it's a go to what does God say is true, and by faith, even pausing to have that that interaction with the Lord is it's worshipful. Lord, here's what you say is true. I I know this, and that's usually when I've got a I got to text somebody and be like, hey, I'm feeling tempted right now. Would you pray for me? Um, which helps get it in the light, which light is sin's kryptonite. So it doesn't just make everything go away, but it's helpful. And then I'm able to, able to be like, okay, I really got to consider myself dead. So I got to, I got to get out of this situation or I got to, you know, delete whatever I'm thinking about doing, or I got to leave the house or I got to whatever. Right. And then I'm making that decision to not present my mind, my heart, my affections to whatever the temptation is whether it be another person or whether it be a substance or whether it be a, you know, an action or whatever it may be. So there's all of that is it's not just a, Hey, don't do it. Stop it. Which is like, that's right. Willpower. He's actually going to show here in a minute um, throughout the rest of this week. So when you get into chapter seven, there's a way to relate to the law that is slavish, that is not spirit empowered. That is not faith empowered. That actually is going to just produce this miserable, like, I don't have any power. I can't, I do what I don't want to do. And I have no 
all of that. He says there's a way to relate to the commandments of God that is going to be slavish. And he's going to say, you've actually been liberated from the law now to now draw near by the spirit through faith for strength that God will give you to help you to live. He says, there's, there's a better way. So it's not just a don't do it. There is a don't do it, but it's a don't do it by faith in the power of the spirit through the promises of God that is other powered rather than just willpower of I'm going to be a better person today. I'm going to get it together. Does that make sense? There's, there's two different sources of strength. And that's what the Lord wants you to look to. He wants you to say, Karen, of course you feel weak. That's good news for you because in your weakness, I'm strong. So grab that, bring it out into the open and be like, I'm totally weak. All I want to do is go gamble or go drink or go hook up or go, you know, waste 40 hours watching shows, like whatever I want to do. Like, here we go. Does that make sense? So that's all worshipful. So it's not just a don't do that, but it's a let's go back to the, what do we know about God and begin there. Was, yeah, and I was also thinking a little bit relationally, how when you interact with people, you come with that balance of truth and love and, you know, that it's not all out of whack because of what, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and yeah, our relations with, relationships with other people, that's why it's always wise to, I think, be, begin your day um, by considering what God's word says. Meet with God before you start meeting with people. I don't think... That, that's not that's a that's a word of wisdom I think rather than like exhortation you have to do that but I think it's wise to do that at least it is for me I relate much better to other humans if I've met with the Lord first have heard his word my heart is submitted I'm trusting him I'm filled with contentment in him and then when things start going wacky I could say all right Lord help me draw upon the reservoir of fresh grace that I've been thinking about rather than like I can get real impulsive and mean and irritable if i'm just waking up and like let's just go get it you know give me, <laughs> give me some give me some news all right because i need some news because i don't and then i'll get on social media and then oh now i'm even madder um and like that's it's that's not so gonna help you know i mean it's true you're just gonna fuel your flesh if you wake up and just start drinking from the world like i gotta know what stocks to invest in today or i gotta know who, to, who said what or who wrote a blog about you know the book that was great or whatever is gonna make me mad today um so there's that can happen sometimes Any other, yo? Um, when Jesus talks about like cutting off your arm or gouging out your eye yeah. in order to like rid yourself of sin, yep. is that something that we should like be thinking to do for like every temptation that we struggle with? Like, or is that only for things that are like besetting sins or like, like, I don't know. I Like, I know that you have the example of like, your phone like being set up in such a way that it's like it like you have it set up so that you just can't do certain sins right right and like there are other things that we can do to like cut off our arm to make it so that we just can't sin are we supposed to do that in like every area like should we be thinking about fighting sin in a way that's like extreme like more extreme sure. than we typically do for like all of the sin that we struggle with I, I think, um, so this, I would answer this question differently for different people. Um, I think we always should be willing to do that. We should always be willing to cut off hand, pluck out eye, regardless of, of what it is. What I don't think it means that we need to do is I need to think of every sin that I could commit and begin setting myself up in such a way that I won't be able to give into those sins. I think that's how you become a monk. Like, I mean, I think it's a well-intended pursuit of God where you're like, I'm just going to put myself in a situation where I can never be tempted. The problem is you can't get away from yourself. You're still in a cave somewhere by yourself, which you can send a bunch there too. All right. So I, I, what I would say is I think you want to keep a pulse on how is your flesh being provoked? How are you being tempted to respond? Because there's some sins by God's grace that are just not real attractive to me that I'm just like, Okay, that might be your thing, somebody else, but like, that's not how I am, which doesn't mean that I should be self-righteous and be like, oh, how could you? Like, be like, all right, well, I got plenty of my own stuff. So, so I think you don't want to, you know, I think things that aren't, that don't feel like that right now, that don't seem like real dangers, I think you should always know they could become dangers, because I do think over time, even our appetite changes a little bit for what we want, and 
you know, from from sin. But I think the things that do pull on us like that, I think you got to find ways to not not do, not give into them. And you need to be really intentional, right? Um, so I do think we're not nearly as vigilant against sin as we should be. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's is where you want to have other people around you helping you, you know, think think through that. So you should always be willing to cut out anything that you need to. Um, and I think you should, should keep a fresh pulse on what is it that's pulling you. And if you find yourself making provision for the flesh, meaning keeping something in your life that is makes it easier to sin, makes sin accessible, keeps it on demand. Like you, you want to, you want to cut that thing out. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Does that help? Is that what you're looking for? Yeah. I, yeah. It's like, I was basically was having a conversation with your sister about sin struggle and we were talking about Jesus saying that. And I was just kind of thinking like, I don't know, there's other, there's like sin that feels like looming in my life. That's yeah. like really hard. But then there are other things that like, I also struggle with and I was just, wasn't sure like, I don't know if you're supposed to like keep it all like on the same scale. Right. I, I, yeah, that's where I would say, however you're being, however it's live for you, but you always need to be aware that other things could come in and become appealing that you thought, I never thought I'd struggle with that, but wow, now I do. Cause that, that can happen. So. Yeah, Pat. I think all this plays a very important part in know, knowing that there is an enemy out there mm -hmm. and who your enemy is and he knows you. Yeah. So what, it sounds like she's talking more about being defensive, whereas Paul, what you were talking about, reading, reading, getting to God's word first, talking about putting on the armor of God, you have a sword, so taking the taking the offense against it. Like even in here, sin was invited into this room. But you know, we're working together against him, and as soon as we go out, he's gonna start attacking us. Um, so if you would say a word against, because I've often used the tactic of if you can rebuke the enemy through the blood of Jesus Christ. Is that correct? In a way, so you are not going to, you know, I'm telling you, you are not winning this battle today in the name of yeah, and that's that's where I would say um, the the pattern that we see in Scripture is is less of Satan, I rebuke you, and it's much more of Lord um, Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, lead me not into temptation, deliver me from the evil one. So the the typical pattern in in Scripture is for us to call upon the Lord to be our like to put on the, the armor of God. It's a call for us to to come in faith, to the battle, in the strength of the Lord. Lord, I have an enemy, and he is, he is tempting me, and I am, would you deliver me from his, his schemes today? Would you help me to see them? Would you protect me? Would you guard me? Would you put a hedge of protection around me? Um, and it's, I think we, the, the scriptural pattern seems much, much less talking to Satan um, and much more crying out to the Lord to be our strength. So I think it's there are times when I'll be tempted, I'll be like, no, like I'll do that John Piper thing. Um, and then I'll just cry, I'll be like, Lord, help me right now. Um, because me, uh, yeah, the spiritual warfare is not so much, I've got on my armor and I'm ready to fight Satan. It is, the, the armor is the Lord is the warrior. And I, by faith, are being strengthened in the strength of his might. And I'm coming by faith under him and saying, Lord, help, I'm scared, just like a child does. They run downstairs, daddy, I'm scared, I had a bad dream. And you hold them and you say, I got you, let me pray for you. That is the posture of a Christian. We're like, there's there's a battle. So I think knowing that and much more running to the Lord and saying, Lord, help me. So I'm not saying there's something wrong in, in saying, you know, no Satan, I'm not doing that today. I'll, I'll do that sometimes, but it's much more Lord right now, I am feeling attacked help me Jesus. So it's a flee to him. Um, similar to what we see in the book of Jude, where, you know, the, uh, when Michael's dealing with Satan, he says, the Lord rebuke you. So it's like, he just, he gives it to the Lord there in Satan's face kind of thing. So good. But I think being aware that we are temptable is, is very important. And the offensive is fleeing unto Jesus 
and, and crying out for him to be our, our refuge and taking his word and applying it rather than, than, than following Satan's temptations. So, yeah. Um, Which, by the way, I'm happy to camp out here because this is like, this is kind of where the rubber hits the road for a lot of us. And this is a, this is, this is a vital part to be able to understand in, in your daily, your daily life. So I'm, I'm happy to camp out here. So, yeah. Yeah. So you describe this process. It's very clear that this is, this is about like it's hard, it's difficult, it's it taxing. Yeah. So I'm thinking of a situation right now where uh rather than jumping into that, the yeah. person is just like, I like one thing, I don't want to stop. Yeah. I like it and it's easier. And we're, it, in a lot of ways, it does feel a lot easier just not dive into this battle of submitting to the Lord, turn off. What counsel would you give to somebody who's saying, I get that, I don't want to do that? You know, be like, what do you what do you mean you don't want to do that? Like I like doing this, I don't want to stop. Yeah. And what you what you're talking about there, it just sounds terrible. Like what count? What does that look like? What, what does that look like to talk to that person? Like, why does it sound? Why does it sound terrible? It just sounds taxing. It sounds way easier just to do this thing. I like it. It feels good. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I just it's, what you're saying is it just sounds miserable. So it. it de- depends on who the person is and how well I know them. But someone who says, I just like sinning and I don't want to obey God because it's hard. I would say, um, I'd say it it is a war. Galatians says it is, you know, uh, walk by the spirit. You will not satisfy the the desires of the flesh. Uh, The desires of the flesh are against the spirit. The desires of the spirit are against the flesh. These are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Um, so there's a war going on. So expect it to be hard. Um, do you think God's lying to you that it's better to know him? Do, do you think God's telling you the truth that his ways are true joy? Like Jesus says in John 15, 11, um, that he has spoken these things and my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Do you think Jesus is lying to you? Like, and if they're like, you know, I just, I, yeah, I think he's lying. And I'd be like, okay. And that's where I want to back up and say, let's talk about what it means to be a Christian. And they may not be a believer, right? So if someone loves sin and hates God, like that's, that's the mark of a non-believer. So we'd want to potentially visit that at some point. I think we would acknowledge though, that believers can, can feel that, like, I really like my sin, yeah, it'd be like, sounds like you're feeding it. So I think one of the things you want to go back to is, do you, it's, it's a question that Jesus asked, you know, the, the man, um, the man with the mat, do you, do you want to, do you want to be well? You know? And if they're like, I don't want to be well, you can't make people do stuff. And then, then I would, I would just want to really, I would give them a warning, a strong warning that the Lord says that a life that is characterized by rejecting him and his word leads to hell. And I just need you to know you're making decisions that are putting you on the path to pursue eternal destruction. And it's, it's, it's laced with candy and it's, it's cotton candy the whole way to hell. And you are just gobbling it up right now. God is even through our conversation, warning you, helping you because he loves you that there's a better way. He would call you to repent of that and to trust him. If you want help with that, I'll do whatever it takes to what Alex said, cut off your hand, pluck out your eye. We can do whatever we need to, to stop feeding the beast. Because when you feed your sinful flesh, it only gets stronger. So it sounds to me like you've been feeding that beast. We need to, we need to, you know, the sumo illustration, we need to starve him. And I'm happy to help you do that. I'm here. I want to rescue you from the fire, which is what the Bible says you're supposed to do. So you're, you're going to try and plead with them. Um, but, you know, and I think, you know, sometimes we feel uncomfortable warning people with that sort of strong language, but that's like, what the, that's what the Bible does. It's really clear. Don't be deceived. Like, the, look up how many times it says, do not be deceived in the Bible. I mean, it's striking how many times believers are commanded to not be deceived. So just know that way of thinking leads to death and it's, it's utterly dangerous, but there's a better way. So Jesus promises you better. Do you want that? If so, I'm, I'm happy to help you do whatever we can to cut off 
you know, the inflow of sin and to start pursuing God. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll meet up with you at 530 every morning uh, for the next, you know, for the next two weeks. Let's let's begin. Like, I'll meet you somewhere. Let's go. Let's do this. And we'll, you know, do whatever else you need to do to cut out sin and to, to try to help them. So um, does that make sense? So, yeah, but I, I think they should they should not leave the, com- the conversation feeling comfortable. Not that you want to be mean to them, but yeah. Yo. Um, okay. So in Hebrews, it talks about Jesus being a great high priest who sympathizes with our weakness because he was tempted in every way that we are yep. without sin. I have two questions on that. One, can you kind of help explain, like, I don't know, why that's supposed to actually be comforting or, like, helpful to us in, like, fighting our sin? And then two, in James, it says that, like, God tempted by evil so like how was how do those fit together yeah yeah like, i cut you off go ahead oh no just yeah how do those things go together and how was like so when it says jesus is tempted by sin and then god can't be tempted by sin what does that mean it's it's this um jesus was really truly tempted but god because of his holy nature does not actually want sin so there's a sense in which jesus didn't experience the same thing that we do in the sense of he actually desires sin. But that at the same time doesn't mean that it wasn't real and pressing and there and that he could understand why people would want that. Um, but it's, he doesn't actually have the evil impulse of, you know, kind of playing with it a little bit before you push it away. Like that's, he doesn't have that impulse. He just sees it for what it is and resists it. So the way it's comforting for us is that he understands, it's not just that he's been tempted, but he endures the entire temptation and resists it. And Satan goes away tired. Where most of us will resist for a couple minutes and then maybe give in. And then Satan walks away having done what he wanted to sometimes. Or if, if we resist, he goes away, uh, you know, tired, if you will. But, um, but the, the point is that Jesus, he, he understands that it's hard for us to trust God in every sort of, sort of situation. Like, he understands. That's, I mean, when he was in the garden, like, he, he cried out, is there any other way, <laughs> you know? But not my will, but thy will be done, right? So, I mean, there's, there's a comfort to where we can go. And the, Jesus says, I understand why it's hard. It makes sense that it's hard to trust here. I've been there. I did it for you. So in all the ways that you're trying to do it, I I sympathize with you and I'm with you in it. Also, um, he is able able to be compassionate toward us, which which helps us to just know that God's not just up there being like, what is wrong with you? Um, But it's a, I I will help you. I will help you. There's a tenderness from the Lord that woos us to trust him. That, that, that moves us to come unto him and to cling to him for help. Um, so Jesus never actually desired sin in the way that we do because we have a sinful nature. He didn't, but he understands that what temptation is like. So he wasn't tempted by sin in the sense that um, he actually desired it, but he felt the onslaught of Satan in his ear ongoing until Satan got worn out and went away. So Jesus understands what that's like for us to have Satan coming after us. And he he is tender toward us and compassionate toward us and promises to help us in the midst of it. Does that make sense? I mean, I think there's some limit to my ability to explain what was going on in the, in the mind of Jesus in the midst of that. But that, I think that's the, the, the emphasis of the text is he understands come unto him. And also he is able to resist perfectly so take confidence in that. He did it perfect in your place. And when, sorry, when it says like he was tempted in every way as we are, like, so that just means that like he understands what it's like to be pulled towards like any particular sin. It doesn't mean like if I'm really being tempted and like freed or like I'm being really tempted and blessed, it doesn't mean that like Jesus experienced that specific temptation. Yeah, I, I think it's it's the first. It's that Jesus understands what it's like to endure the the full arsenal of Satan, 
right? So yes, Jesus was not a woman. So there are ways that sisters may be particularly tempted that Jesus wasn't like, well, I was tempted as a woman in this way. It's none of that kind of stuff, but it's the idea of the onslaught of sin. He's been tempted in every way. He has faced the full arsenal of Satan's, you know, sick, twisted offerings, and he's been able to say no to it. That's that's the point. He's the perfect human who resists sin perfectly in the face of the evil. Yes. Um, you kind of mentioned earlier about what you know, what steps we can take um, in walking with others if they like confess sin. But like, how do we walk into a place where maybe like I just like what's one of our greater temptations is to hide sin just in general. And so I'm thankful that. I do have those types of relationships now where, you know, we're open and sharing and more transparent with one another. But I think you're often walking into situations where there is a lot of transparency. And so do you have thoughts on like, how do we help cultivate that in relationships so that there is even more trust in, in sharing the things that we're struggling with, um, whether that's small groups or just individual friendships, when you feel like that's lacking? Yeah. So how do we be more open and honest about our sin? You know, um, uh, two things initially come to mind. The first thing is to remember that just being honest about your sin and just being authentic is not an end in itself. We live in a day and age which is very different than the age before. So like in Butch's generation, Pat's generation, the mark of the mark of you know external righteousness was you don't talk about stuff. You kind of keep it to yourself. Our generation, it's you tell all your stuff, you know, way TMI all the time, and you're just being authentic. Like, you know, I mean, I almost gave you examples that you don't need, like, but like, I almost did it, right? So, like, you give way, you, I'm just so authentic. I'm so authentic. And everybody's like, oh, that's so authentic. But, like, <laughs> if just being honest about it without any real, like, aim to change it, that's not, that's not righteousness either. It's just the opposite struggle of there's nothing going on. Everything's good. I'm good. I'm fine. Thanks for praying for me. You know, like that is, is no different in one sense before the Lord, than here's all my stuff. Um, but I'm not, no, I'm not changing. So like authenticity is not an end in itself. Um, it should lead you to re re repentance. Right? Second thing is just the reality that people will imperfect friends will let you down if you're honest with them about your sin. They, they just will. Sometimes you'll be really needed, you'll really need some help, and you'll share with a friend, and they won't check in and see how it went. You'll ask them to pray for you, and they they won't reach out to see if they, they pray. Now, they may have actually prayed, and they may have actually thought about it. So you got to be careful of Satan's attack to be like, see, they don't care. See, you shouldn't have trusted nobody. See what happened. But you actually don't know if people have been praying for you which actually is more important than them checking in. Now, we should check in with one another. Um, does that make sense? So I think we want to be, no, and there will be some people who will say the wrong things and it will hurt you. Um, there will be people who, who may tell other people uh, about some of your business that you wish they hadn't. And it may be well-intended, but it still may really hurt. Um, and it's not an excuse for them doing that. So I think there's, you've got to know it's, it's risky to be honest and open and vulnerable with another sinner. But it's more risky to not because the, the danger of not means that then you're gonna not live in the light and that's more dangerous than doing it. So it's, yeah, it's real similar to the, like the should churches gather right now or not? Like it's, it's dangerous for people to get together because of, of the pandemic, but it's more dangerous long-term for believers to not be around other believers. And like, they're, they're both, they're both real things you need to think about. So the way you do it requires wisdom and thoughtfulness and prayerfulness. So what I do is I, I, I'm selective with how many people I, I share all my stuff with. Um, and Yeah, I, I think you just got to know that your your impulse to not is not your friend. Like for me to say, well, next time I'll talk about that. You just got to know that's 
probably not from the Lord. Um, it's it's your desire to cover up is, is not 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 safe either. Just think of it as as burying burying an MRI report that says that you have some concerning images. Like just taking that and then burying it does not mean it's not still there. So it's 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 more dangerous to to do that. So I think you want to pray the Lord would help you to for to trust that He is going to be your ultimate help. And I think you want to pray for good friends. I think you want to share with somebody. Hey, listen, can I just be honest with you? This is scary for me to be honest and to talk about this stuff. So it's hard for me to even to trust you. I know you're a great person and all this kind of stuff, but I trust you enough that I'm gonna I want to develop this kind of relationship. But I also want you to know it's it's hard for me to have this kind of relationship. And here's the reason why. Would you pray for me in that? So I think even opening yourself up about that begins the transparency that's needed for the sort of 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 um, of love that that I think helps us to heaven. Yeah. So how do you be on the other side of that? So how do you help invite that type of like knowing that that's such a hard thing for people to yeah. open up with? How yeah. do you be cultivate a type of setting where that is more likely to happen? Yeah, I think you want to pray for divine appointments, meaning pray, God, bring the right person. And let's have a conversation that seems to be trending that way. And just even say, hey, can I ask? I want to ask you a personal question. Do you have anybody in your life right now that you feel like you're actually able to be honest with? Um, and let me let me explain to you why I'm even asking that question, because they might be like, why? Well, you want to like, will you after? Right. Like, you know, that most people are going to just put up the put up the the guard. And then, and then just explain to them, I have learned over the years that I need that and that it's really hard for me to have. Um, and I just want you to know, I'd love to talk with you about, about what it would look like for, for you and I to have that kind of like, yeah, honest relationship with each other, which would mean you've got to be able to hear some of my stuff too, because this is not just, you know, I'm not some professional counselor that you're just going to come in and I'm going to sit and take notes while you lay on the couch and pour out your heart and just be like, well, you are messed up, but I'll, that'll be $50. And I'll see you next time. Or nowadays, $150. And I'll see you next time. Um, you know, so it's, it's not that um, it's a, we're fellow sinners that want to come together and be honest. So I think inviting it, asking the question. Um, and if somebody says, yeah, I really do have that, then I think you can praise God for that. Um, and yeah, but I think even asking the question is helpful sometimes. Well, sure, we might as well. Go ahead. Uh, we'll do a chat question and then we'll do your question. Go ahead. This is from Isabel. Uh, asking Hi, Isabel. about the uh, in Dallas reservoir of like drawing on truths from throughout the day. Um, are there practical ways that you've consistently found helpful in keeping your morning devotion time or on the forefront of your mind throughout the day? Some people use phone alarms, reminders, yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. How do you keep... Uh, morning devotionals on the forefront of your day. So that's why I even end Bible time with be like, okay, what did you hear today that was helpful for you? Trying to help you to say, okay, let me get one thing that I want to grab from. Like, so today for me, it seems like the idea of just instruments is going to be, be on my mind that I'm going to be thinking about, okay, my body right now is an instrument for either sin or for righteousness. And I want to, I want to think about how do I present it to the Lord? I want to present my heart, my mind, my tongue, everything to the Lord today. So I think when you're done, so pray, pray going in, ask God to help you to see something. Um, ask him to burden your heart. So maybe it's a phrase from scripture. Maybe it's a word. Maybe it's a whole verse. So you want to maybe write down with an app or if you're old school with a little, you know, post-it note or um, whatever card and then um, and, and memorize a, a passage of scripture. Like all those things are helpful. I think it's also helpful sometimes um, there have been different seasons and for me it's always changing because I, I, I can't do the same thing all the time very well but sometimes I'll have somebody else be like hey this month let's read through Ephesians together and how about every morning when we're done we text one thing to one another and and that just even having that on the day that I can look back and be like oh yeah that was helpful and oh that was helpful as well what this person said so I think there's, you can do that in community as well. Should we confess our sins to individuals who've proven they're not trustworthy? Should we confess our sins to individuals who've proven they're not trustworthy? No. Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. I think no. that's one of the issues uh, underlying the dialogue we were having. Yeah. Is I mean, we have believers in the faith that we could very well easily confess our sins to. Right. But 
but yeah. then we have a difficult time with slander. Yeah, yeah. so time with gossip and difficult time with uh, being able to hold the tongue. Yeah. So, um, and not respecting uh, uh, the boundaries that come along with the yeah. confessions. No, I agree. So that's like so for instance, um, I, I'm not a priest in like a Catholic sense, but they have to give you a reason. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's true. So, like, I I know a lot of stuff about a lot of people. Um, people confess stuff to me all the time, and I I think it was one of the most holy things that somebody can do is to come and say, "Hey, this is what's going on in my life," and I'm a vault. Like, I mean, I'm I'm very liberal with my own sins. They're like, "Hey, here's what's going on in my life," but. If somebody confesses to you some of their sins, that's, that's, yeah, you got to be really, really careful with what you do with that. Um, now, I'm also very honest with people. Like, so if someone tells me something that they're like, they're planning to go uh, kill somebody. I, I tell them, I'll be like, okay, thank you for telling me. Let's talk about this. Be like, if you're, we've got to change what you're planning to do, or we're gonna, we're gonna have to call for some kind of intervention. So I'm gonna let them know that I'm gonna let somebody else know. Um, but yeah, so there's, you wanna be honest uh, in the conversation with people, right? But, but if we're just talking about kind of normal, like conversations, like you should consider it a great honor if somebody's pouring out their heart to you and um, be really cautious with what you do with that. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great grace to, to be able to help somebody in, in that way. Yeah, it's just, I can't help but think about the book of Proverbs and all the, and all the characteristics of how the fool uh, goes about slandering and revealing secrets. Yeah, revealing secrets, yeah. That and the, that and the loquacious individual um, that just does not know when to be quiet. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's just going to go back to why are you telling people stuff about other people like what what are you seeking to gain because if you think it's going to actually endear people to you it's actually doing the exact opposite it's assuring people that you're you're untrustworthy and so it actually works again so i always encourage you to be to be that sort of person who invites it um ask for the lord to use you in that um and yeah and be um yeah be 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 uh, a, a good steward of those things. Now, uh, one of the things we tell our, our kids is um, there can be secrets, but th there can be surprises, but no secrets um, in our house. Um, meaning it's okay to keep things on wrap for the sake of, uh, you know, surprising someone, but you're, you shouldn't have a secret that is going to be dangerous for other people to not know that like permits them to live a double life. So that's where I would say, sometimes people confess something. I'd be like, okay, you really need to do something about that. Let's, let's now work out a plan for you being honest with the other people that you need to be honest with. And let's, let's work on that plan and really push them towards that. And that's, you know, that's another, another sermon for another day, but um, yeah, all that to say, be the sort of person that is able to receive those sorts of, uh, honest, vulnerable details and, and be a good steward of them to help that person for the glory of God. Well, good conversation. Um, this is this is important stuff, though. So I, this is not uh, the goal, again, is not just to make it through a bunch of scripture, but it's for the scripture to make it through us. And I think the fact that, you know, spurred plenty of conversation is good to, to, to meditate on. Next time, Lord willing, we will make it through the rest of chapter six and probably the first part of chapter uh, chapter seven. So as we prepare to go, I'd love to hear two or three things that were helpful for you today. Um, that think I needed to hold on to that. What's uh, what's something that you heard today? Kevin? I'm going to say, I think it's the, the righteousness and unrighteousness and then not straddling the fence. I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a good. yeah, it's either righteous or unrighteous. You straddle, straddle the, spent, the fence, you will get splinters. So don't don't do that. Yeah. So yeah. Well, I think we said that honesty and authenticity uh, confesses all your sin, but without an actual aim to change that, is not true repentance. I think that was really helpful. Probably something that that I, I probably 
like it's always like as long as I like, say it all good, not really. You know, you, not just that. You actually have to follow through. Yeah. Yeah, there's a deceptive um, yeah, there's a way that sin even works in honesty that makes you feel like, oh, the pressure's off. I've been honest now. That makes you kind of feel like, okay, I don't need to do anything else. Where you're like, no, that's the beginning of the work. It's an essential part of the work, but it's the beginning of the work. Um, now let's seek to aim to do whatever we can to not be back there again. So. Anything else? Yep. Um, just that um, I, I, I think part of giving in to temptation is pushing God away. Yeah. You know, if we're giving in, it's like, God, leave me alone. Exactly, yeah. It's whereas the opposite is to, uh, I guess, to have an ongoing conversation and relationship with the Lord. Yeah. That we're not um, not letting the sin break that. Good. Yeah. yeah. So understand that sin wants to interrupt your fellowship with the Lord. So that's why it says, do not grieve the Spirit. So the Spirit is doing work in you. And in order to sin, you've got to say, stop the work, Spirit. I don't want to be like Jesus right now. I want to do this. Like, being cognizant, that's that's what's happening when we're sinning and, and and making it a personal sort of thing and not just abstract. It's good. I'm grateful for y'all. Uh, it's a joy to you know walk through a text like this with, with you guys when you're I mean you're I think I think you guys show up because you you wanna you wanna love the Lord more. And that's super encouraging to me. So let's let's fight sin in his strength for his glory. We'll keep going on this next week, but uh, or next, on Thursday and the next week as well, but Thursday. So let me, uh, let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for the way that you, yeah, you, you love us. Thank you for the, uh, the help that you give us by your spirit. And Lord, would you help us to consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God? Would you help us to present our, our bodies uh, to you as instruments for righteousness and not to sin uh, as an instrument of unrighteousness? God, we can't do that in ourselves, and we can't do it in sheer willpower. So would you help us be our strength and our strong support? We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.